to their death. And so they will at last win respect as men who recognize themselves to be a foreign origin and have by an act of free choice decided to change their nationality, succeed in getting more respect than those who pretend they have no nationality to exchange. Even the Germans who today, that's the 60s of the last century, even the Germans who in the 60s despise all the painstaking efforts of their Jewish fellow citizens to Germanize themselves and care nothing at all for the cultural achievements which the Jews are forever enumerating, will, once the Jews are a nation, give them as a nation what they refuse to give them as individuals, rather like Dr. Adenauer. Um, but that day may not be near, and in the meanwhile, religion is the great preservative of Judaism and must not be diluted or brought up to date. The Jewish religion says, yes, surprisingly for a communist agitator, the Jewish religion is the foundation of all egalitarianism and socialism, for it recognizes no castes, no classes, and assumes the interrelation of all creation. It allows no feudalism, no social hierarchy. It is just equal in the true source of the noblest social movements of modern times. It does recognize the principle of nationality. It excludes chauvinistic nationalism, such as that of Prussia, as morally wrong. But equally, it leaves no room for its contrary artificial cosmopolitanism, which by denying even the just claims of nations, falsifies the facts, sets up illusory ideals, and with its bogus prospectuses, lure innocent men to their doom. The first condition of true internationalism is that there shall be nationalities. Internationalism movement not to abolish, but to unite nations. Hence, Hess welcomes the renaissance of Jewish historiography among German Jews, and quotes with approval names like Weil, Compert, Bernstein, Wiel, and above all, of course, Gretz, who became his friend, and from whom history, from whose history of the Jewish people, people says Hess, not church, not religion, he copiously and happily quotes. Everything that Hess had suppressed for 20 years now came welling up. He constantly returns to beliefs instilled in him by his father and grandfather. He says, I myself, had I a family, would, in spite of my dogmatic heterodoxy, not only join an orthodox synagogue, but would also observe in my home all the feast and fast days, so as to keep alive in my heart and in the hearts of my children the traditions of my people. He denounces all forms of compromise, all forms of adaptation, Prayers must not be shortened. German versions must not be used instead of Hebrew. Jewish preachers must be held in greatest honor. What he fears more than anything is nihilism. The reform movement is, he simply regards as something thin, unconvincing, a pathetic and vulgar imitation of Christianity, a counterfeit modern substitute for something ancient, genuine, and valuable. If he must choose, he says, he'd rather keep all the 613 rules of the Jewish religion. One day, perhaps, a new Sanhedrin Meeting in Jerusalem will change or abrogate them. Till then, the Jews must save what they possess, their spiritual heritage unmodified. He mocks at the fictitious missions invented by some Jews as the sort of thing which they think the Jews are called upon to perform among the nations, say, to teach toleration to other religions, or the doctrine of pure theism, theism or even the arts of commerce. It is better, says Hess, for the Jew who doesn't believe in a national regeneration of his people to labor like an enlightened Christian of today for the dissolution of his religion. I can understand how one can hold this view. What I don't understand is how one can believe simultaneously in enlightenment and in the Jewish mission in exile. That is to say, in the ultimate dissolution and the continued existence of Judaism at one and the same time. Do the Jews who wish to sacrifice their historical past to such abstractions of liberty or progress rarely imagine that anybody will be taken in? Does Meyerbeer really think that anybody besides himself is deceived because he, Meyerbeer, so sedulously keeps off biblical themes in his operas? Having settled his account of the German Jews, Hess turned to the practical problem of the colonization of Palestine. He noted that Rabbi Hirsch Kalischer of Thorn had already drafted a plan for such a movement. He notes that Monsieur Ernest Laran, in a book on the New Oriental Question, supported this view. Laran, at this time one of Napoleon III's secretaries, was a Christian and an early Zionist. He denounced the rich emancipated Jews for their indifference, the pious Jews for their defeatism, and said that a state in Palestine is the only solution to the Jewish problem. He believed that only the Sultan and the Pope were obstacles to this plan, but that French democracy would prevail against both. He spoke of the fundamental right of the Jews to historic home, and he believed, I think a little too optimistically, that the Turks would, for a handful of gold, toss them by rich Jewish bankers, admit large Jewish colonization. 
He spoke lyrically on the mystery of the Jewish survival, on the fact unparalleled history of mankind that faced by enemies every age, Romans, Europeans, Asiatics, Africans, barbarians, feudal kings, grand inquisitors, Jesuits, modern political tyrants, they yet survived and multiplied. The French and the Jews must march together. Together they must revitalize the parched land of Palestine and rescue it from the terrible Turk. French democracy, Jewish genius, modern science, that is to be the new alliance that would save an ancient people and revive an ancient land. Well, Hess, as you can all imagine, welcomed this initiative on the part of Monsieur Laran, and in a very apocalyptic mood, he said that the national solidarity and unity, which is the base of the Jewish religion, would gradually make all men one. Natural science would liberate the workers, racial struggles would come to an end, and so would those of classes. Jewish religion and Jewish history, a vast amalgam in which he included the teachings of the Old Testament and the Talmud, the Essenes and Jesus, said to men, be of the oppressed and not of the oppressors, receive abuse and return it not, let the motive of all your actions be the love of God and rejoice in suffering. By this gospel, the world would be regenerated. But the first requirement is the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine. The rich Jews must buy the land and train agricultural experts. The Alliance Israelite must help Rabbi Natanek of Stuhl Weissenberg in Hungary, who is ready to interview the Sultan with a letter of recommendation from the Turkish ambassador in Vienna. <laughs> Jewish colonists must be led by men trained in modern methods of thought and action, not by obscurantist rabbis. The plan can be realized, it must be realized. Nothing stands in the way but bigotry. Bigotry and cosmopolitanism, from both of which the Jews recoil instinctively. On a note of high enthusiasm, Hess ends his sermon. I must say, he had traveled a very long way from the anti-religious communism and anti-nationalism of his younger days. The fierce attack on assimilationist performers was of course in part an attack on his own dead self. The solution, which consists of dignified national dissolution by means of systematic intermarriage and by educating children in a faith different from one's own, which he now so fiercely denounced, was the very conduct that he himself had earlier advocated. The conscientious internationalism of his young Hegelian days was replaced by the realization, which seems destined to come sooner or later to every Jewish thinker about social themes. The realization that the Jewish problem is something so generous and seems to be in need of a specific solution of its own, that it resists the solvent of even the most powerful universal panaceas. Even Trotsky, we are told, when he was an old revolutionary living in Paris, after Hitler's persecutions, was brought to concede that the Jews were a nationality and did need a country of their own. Nor was this, in Hesse's case, any more than that of Trotsky, simply the final reaction of an old, persecuted, exhausted old socialist, who, tired of waiting for the realization of his universalist dreams, settles for a more limited nationalist solution, and returns to the days of his youth to escape from the excessive burden of the universal social struggle. To think this is to misunderstand Hess profoundly. He was a man who left no belief unless he convinced himself by rational methods that it was false. His Zionism did not cause him, for example, to abandon socialism. He felt no incompatibility between communist ideals and a belief in a Jewish national resurgement. Hess was not like Hegel or Marx, a historical thinker of genius who broke the previous tradition, perceived relationships hitherto unknown, imposed his vision on mankind, and transformed the categories in terms of which men think uh, about their past and their destiny. But nor did he suffer from the defects of these despotic system builders. He was intellectually scrupulously honest and he felt no desire and no tactical need to force the facts. The strongest single characteristic of his writings, especially of his later works, is a pure-hearted devotion to the truth, expressed with candid, at times childlike, simplicity and innocence. 